Welcome everybody. My name is Leslie Stevenson. I'm the publisher of Governance, a monthly newsletter. Welcome to this webinar, which we're doing with our friends from the Board Effectiveness Guild again. Um, we're very pleased to have them with us and looking at um, stakeholder perspectives on board reviews uh, from their own experience. We would ask you, we're going to run through, we've got the four presentations. Um, to begin with and then we'll finish pause at the end for discussions questions what have you um unfortunately i don't seem to be able to see the questions on my screen anymore but i'll try and sort that out whilst um the others are speaking if you have got any questions please can you put them in the q a and if there's anything urgent i will sort of at the end of each session i won't interrupt the speakers as they're speaking but if something comes up that you want an urgent um, question answered at the end of each session, I will go into it. So I'm going to start by introducing Chris Stamp, who's going to do a sort of a general introduction to the subject and then move on. And he's going to talk about um, reviews and senior management. So, Chris, would you like to start? Thank you, Leslie, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Yes, I think uh, over the past few years, um, the stakeholder perspective as far as boards are concerned um, has become an increasingly significant and uh, important area of, um, of, of the whole study of board effectiveness. Um, as, as you can see from the quote on the screen, um, the FRC in terms of, of sort of listed companies in particular have uh, have said a lot about this and this sort of chimes very much with the focus um that that has really come into place or since 2018 around the uh, stakeholder responsibilities or the responsibilities of boards to stakeholders particularly uh workforce suppliers customers uh, and uh, e even extending to the environment and sort of longer term issues. Um, so when looking at board effectiveness, one cannot uh, see the board in isolation of its own context. And so the purpose of today's webinar is really to uh, draw on our own experience in, in board reviews and how the stakeholder perspective really uh there's uh, an important part in in, in the, the review and the understanding of board effectiveness. Um, I'm going to kick off with a look at the board's relationship with the sort of senior management teams uh, that, that support the board and, and work with the board. Um, and then we'll also look at uh, the sort of owners of the business, the regulators of the business and employees and workforce uh, relationships. Um, these being the key, probably the key stakeholder relationships that we would uh, expect to be thinking about as part of a board review, albeit although uh, by no means you know, an exclusive list of, 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 of the relationships that boards may need to take account of. So if I start with boards and senior management, um, I think there are really two questions that I would like to just talk about briefly. Um, as as being the sort of key questions I would look to examine as part of a, of a board review. Um, and I think it's probably a, an important point to make at the outset that the relationship between boards and management um, actually vary a lot between company uh, or, or organisation, uh, from organisation to organisation. Um, some boards that we, uh, that I talk to, have a very minimal level of interaction with their uh, senior executives, almost to the point of um, exclusion, whereas others will have a very uh, sort of open approach to senior management and uh, will actually have a lot of uh, executives attending, you know, a lot of the board meeting, if not all of it, other than perhaps a few uh, key sensitive areas. But I, I thought it'd be useful to just start by thinking about how does the board and senior management relationship work in 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 the organisation, and um, just picking up on the point that that I made just now that that relationship can be a very flexible one, 
um, in, influenced by a, a lot of uh, different factors about how the board works, how management work, how the company uh, is set up and so on. And so whilst there is a sort of typical uh, graphic here of, of, of what one might expect, particularly in a listed company where you have you know, a, a chair, independent NEDs, and then maybe a couple of executive directors, typically the CEO and CFO, um, and then outside of the executive team, you have a senior management team with some key players in the boardroom, maybe the COO or HR people director, or possibly even um, someone like a risk officer and, and so on. The nature of that actually, it, 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 how that works does vary a lot from company to company. And that in turn actually does have a big impact on how the board's relationship with senior management works. Um, of course, underpinning everything will be the company secretary, who who is the one sort of roving uh, piece in this particular equation because of the the work, the nature of the role and the relationship that they, the company secretary, will have with the NEDs, with the executive directors, and obviously with colleagues on the management team. So I think before getting into the question of how the relationship uh, with senior management impacts on board effectiveness, it is important and useful to understand the nature of that relationship and the reasons for that relationship being uh, what it is. And if I was to, uh, I, I don't think there's necessarily a sort of right or wrong answer to this in terms of what's the best way uh, a board um, should be structured vis-a-vis -vis its senior management team. If I was um, sort of asked to err on uh, one end of the equation or the other, I think I would say that actually having more interaction with the senior management team is actually a very useful thing for boards to do, uh, and therefore having more involvement of senior management in uh, in board meetings and board discussions is is actually something that is worthwhile. But you know, as I, I as I say, there is no right or wrong answer to that. But getting into the specifics of how does the relationship uh, between the board and senior management support board effectiveness, I think it's fair to to sort of focus on three particular aspects. There, there are probably others as well, but these are the sorts of um, areas that I find come up quite uh, quite regularly as part of board reviews. The first um, the first uh, element is actually information and. There is a sort of contract I always feel between the the board members, particularly the non executives and the senior management team, that um, sort of is underpinned by a, a degree of mutual interdependency. The board do require uh, information that that can only be provided by the, the management team uh, to be able to make the decisions they they make. If they don't have that information, they obviously cannot make good decisions. And in in the same um, in the same manner, the executive team needs to have clarity of, of sort of output and direction from the board to be able to um, you know be implementing the decisions and to be understanding exactly where the board is coming from in terms of the decisions it makes. And so, having that sort of communication channel um, is is obviously a key. Uh, to ensuring that good decisions are made and good decisions are implemented. And if you like, that that probably explains why I would tend to have more inputs from senior management in board discussions than less, uh, because there's more chance of, of good communication through that process. Um, the role of the CEO and the CFO within that is, is extremely critical because if the senior management team mm -hmm are not ordinarily present in a board discussion, then they are dependent on the CEO and, and the CFO to explain what the decisions and the discussions have been in the board and, and to convey um, the, uh, the decisions to their team in the same way if they are the only individuals that are contributing to the board discussion, 
they what the way in which they present a proposal or or, or a, a point for discussion mm-hmm. will really influence how the board uh, approaches that discussion and so that sort of uh, channel of communication is very dependent particularly on the ceo but but the cfo um, is important as well um and understanding how that channel works um between the needs of the senior management team and the needs of the non-executive directors in their part part in the decision making process is 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 key i think moving on to to the next area in terms of engagement and where do does this engagement really need to um apply well uh, obviously there are key elements of 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 the uh activity of the organization around strategy risk performance resources and and other areas as well i'm sure um and the nature of that engagement will um depend a lot on the input that comes from management uh and and indeed the nature of the organization and how the board needs to understand um elements of strategy risk and so on so to give a couple of examples if you are in a financial a financial services organization um there will often be a lot more engagement with management around risk and the c critical person for the board to engage with will be the, the the chief risk officer and certainly we find in in board reviews interviewing a chief risk officer in a financial services organization is a really important part of of, of an effectiveness review Similarly, if you've got, uh, for example, a company that is um, uh, embarking on a very significant growth strategy, particularly one that that, that in, involves uh, a lot of M and A work, mergers and acquisitions work, then talking to the team who are involved in that sort of mergers and acquisition strategy will be a key part of the board's effectiveness, and certainly in companies of that uh, with that sort of focus um the the type of uh the involvement of, of the people who are involved in that strategic area of the business is, is key to the effectiveness review and i think just final point really uh, it, this illustrates is the importance of having exposure to the management team and um it is quite often a, a, a sort of area of feedback that uh, i get in the reviews that i do that Neds do want to see more, have more exposure to the management team uh, beyond the the sort of necessary uh, engagement that that comes through the the routine elements of the board business. Sometimes this is necessary. I've talked about risk already and obviously finance, uh, particularly where a CFO is not actually a board member. um, they're, They're pretty much in the board meeting all the time anyway. And that obviously is a necessary level of involvement but beyond that actually exposure to be able to understand a sort of longer term planning horizon is is something that that quite often uh, is commented on by by directors and one of the reasons actually the neds quite like to see uh, members of the management team in the board meeting or in strategy days is because they want to understand who are the next tier down from a succession point of view or from a capability point of view um, or even a strategic growth point of view. And so, again, looking at how that sort of exposure works is really uh, critical to um, board effectiveness and an area where uh, I am always interested to focus on. So that's a very quick sort of canter through uh, the boards and senior management as as a sort of a key stakeholder relationship. I hope that that sort of provided a few uh, um, a few areas of thought to uh, to perhaps think about going forward. Um, but with that, I will hand over. I think now to Alex, who will talk about uh, boards and owners. Thanks, Chris. Um... Uh, and good afternoon to everyone who's uh, who's attended. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, the relationship between boards and, and owners. When you look at the FRC code, um, what it requires is what it describes as a satisfactory dialogue with shareholders. 
Okay, so um, define satisfactory dialogue is really the task uh, during a board review is really, is the conversation a dialogue? And is it honest? Is it open? Um, and uh, are the parties fully involved? Now, obviously, um, on a board, the, um, uh, the shareholder view could be resident in the board itself. Okay, there can be NEDs um, who are, board, who are um, uh, shareholder representatives, and therefore th that voice is in the boardroom. However, it's unlikely in a quota company that all the shareholders are in the, the boardroom, uh, and that needs to be taken account of as well. Similarly, uh, uh, therefore, the, the amount of dialogue that happens between the board outside the boardroom with shareholders is significant. So what's the challenge for, uh, for the board? Well, the challenge really is to achieve that satisfactory dialogue while maintaining the inherent independence of the board, the, the collective responsibility to make the right decisions, the best decisions for the sustainable future of the business. Um, so let's look at it in the boardroom and outside the boardroom. So in the boardroom, um, uh, what are the risks and what are the, the ways of mitigating these risks? Well, the risk is in the boardroom that the shareholder NEDs over-dominate okay, um, the dialogue um, and that the collective will of the board is somehow affected or influ over-influenced. Uh, in one way or another. It therefore falls on the chair okay, to, um, to manage that dialogue and that dynamic uh, in the boardroom incredibly carefully. And um, I've observed in, in certain situations where there have been one shareholder who, um, who uh, dominates conversation, dominates decision making, and actually they, they may be a significant shareholder, therefore they have a board seat, but they may not be a majority shareholder. Um, uh, so, um, so, so the contribution of the chair is something that I'm looking for um, uh, in a board review when, um, when the shareholders are in the room. However, that does not mean that, that all the other NEDs do not have a responsibility. As an independent NED, you have a responsibility to uh, to give your opinion, to give your challenge, to give your your um, your your contribution uh, to board conversation, and not to be uh, over over dominated by other voices. <clears throat> it doesn't. Um, it, it it's no surprise that um, that. Addressing conflicts of interest in the boardroom where shareholders are present is of critical importance. And um, I've seen several situations where uh, separate board committees have had to be set up, um, where there's been an issue that has come, come through, perhaps shareholder changes, maybe shareholder selling or, or buying intent. Um, uh, has meant that, that there has to be management of those conflicts outside the without the shareholder voice um, uh, to be uh, to be heard. So in the boardroom, it's about getting that independent dialogue and that collective decision making, um, uh, managing the the uh, the shareholder's voice outside the boardroom. Uh, the dialogue equally matters and obviously it's a complex thing because because shareholder numbers um uh, vary enormously um what is the task the task is to understand the percept for the board to understand the perceptions of shareholders and to manage its reputation uh, um, with shareholders so there is a credibility and a trust between the parties involved there what I've seen in board reviews is that too, too infrequently there isn't a plan to do that. There isn't. There are activities. There are activities by the chair, activities by the chief executive, dealing with going and and attending to shareholders. But actually, 
Is it a reasoned plan? Is the board understanding what it's trying to achieve in that satisfactory dialogue with uh, with shareholders? I would suggest that it that um that the NED, the other NEDs, the other independent NEDs can contribute often more. Okay, um, and a well constructed uh, shareholder management plan, um. <clears throat> actually can allow can allow different voices from the board to engage in that in creating that satisfactory dialogue okay so use your NED resource as a whole don't allow it to only be be the chief executive and the chair and just on that chief executive and chair point if there is any conflict or any difference of view between the chair and the chief executive it will become evident to shareholders through those those conversations so those differences of opinion between the two of them need to be resolved before the shareholder uh, is engaged and then the last thing that i wanted to talk rapidly about was um where you have a single owner okay and that owner is the government because it's a particular case now I've carried out reviews for many, many um, government-owned businesses. Many of them set up under the Companies Act, okay, uh, creating unitary boards in a very conventional structure. However, okay, there are often um, uh, differences within that. Okay, one is there is one shareholder. Okay, and therefore because there's one. Um, uh, they exert they exert enormous uh, they hold enormous power. Okay, but uh, more importantly, more significantly, it can cut across the governance that is set up in the in the traditional FRC code principles that we all expect. <clears throat> so, what do we have, and what needs to be dealt with? Well, there is a sponsor department for each one of these government companies okay um and in the sponsored department there are people who are responsible for uh, you know address knowing about the performance of that individual uh, business the um uh, however that varies that sponsor role is ill defined often and varies in capability and competence depending on the department and depending on the individuals involved. Now, separately from that, we have the role of UK government investments, which on many, many depart um, uh, govcos um, have a shareholder representative on the board. Again, traditionally, um, uh, you can see how that can be a very useful thing. What in reality, what you have to be clear is what's the role of a sponsor department, what's the role of UKGI, what's the dialogue between both of them, um, and is UKGI's role understood in the board? What I've been aware of is that some of the independent NEDs are unclear about really what UKGI's true role is. So clarity of role. Sponsor and UKGI really matter, and um, uh, and then of course we've got the danger, and the danger is that the government and the civil service, in the way it loves to work, um, creates parallel governance um, of these businesses. So there are often quarterly performance meetings happening between the department and um, uh, and the the govco. You could be careful about that. Is it really just a board board meeting by any other name, um, but not with the NEDs involved who still carry their responsibilities under the Co Companies Act? Um, so there can be lots of cutting across. And similarly, there can be some, some slowing down or frustration of decision making in that process. That can be exacerbated because there are other characters around too, or other roles, I should say. And one of them is the accounting officer role, which, which um, often resides with the CEO. So they have, as 
as defined by that rule, a direct reporting line to the senior uh, the senior uh, echelons of the sponsored department. How does that work? How does that work with the chair? How does that work with the board? What's been communicated there? What's been communicated in any other in any other mechanism? So you can see the complexity of governance that can happen around these single owner owner um, government owned businesses. We really have to get clarity and, and the board review is really about clarity about who's doing what, when, communicating in what way and when. So overall, okay, owner relationships matter, getting that, um, uh, that uh, satisfactory dialogue, absolutely critical, okay? It requires for me, or what I'm looking for is I'm looking for planned communication. Um, I'm looking for clear um, accountabilities, and I'm and I'm I'm looking for kind of clear boundaries between between the parties involved. So that's me um, finished at this point. Over to you, I think, Peter. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Alex. Um, I'm going to talk um, a bit about um, regulators as stakeholders. And, and regulators as stakeholders are stakeholders because they have an interest in the successful performance of the company. Failure impacts on them as well as, as on the company. Um, and it's worth remembering that regulators, some regulators themselves, can instruct firms to, in some situations, to carry out board reviews. And board reviews will often need to be shared with the regulator, depending uh, in which area you operate. Um, and this can be problematic because sometimes uh, you can be subject to more than one regulator. So that's uh, typically the case with some of the large financial services firms may well be uh, answering to more than one regulator. Um, it's worth understanding the framework, the legal framework within which your regulator operates. Uh, they will have statutory objectives. For example, the PRA and the FCA have statutory objectives, which they are expected to meet. And those will impact the way in which they expect companies to operate. And it's the sort of thing they would expect to be at least touched on or covered um, in, in a board review. Uh, regulators can also take the view that NEDs themselves are almost uh, quasi-regulators um, themselves. So you will often see, um, I've often seen in the past, uh, reference, uh, say, by the FCA to INEDs uh, being, having a role in protecting the interests of, of retail consumers. Um, you know, these things may be challenging uh, or challengeable in some senses, but it's very difficult for firms to do that uh, and maintain a good regulatory um, uh, um, relationship. And sometimes the formal requirements may appear to be narrower than actually the interpretation uh, regulators give on, the, on those requirements when they're dealing with firms. The other thing that I think one needs to be aware of is that regulation generally is becoming more muscular. And you can see this in financial services after 2007, 2008 financial crisis. The approach that regulators took was quite different. And we saw a new regime um, for senior managers. Uh, which was uh, far more invasive than the, than the previous approved persons regime. But it's not just in financial services. I think you can see this coming. Argo is going to have powers uh, to, pro, uh, to, to take action in respect of all directors, not just those who are um, uh, accounting professionals. So I think there's a, there is a move in, in that direction. Uh, and we have certainly see with uh, financial services regulators, they will enforce against individuals. Uh, and the consequences of an enforcement action can be really significant for an individual. Um, it may well impact uh, materially on, on uh, future careers. And even when you've just been party to an investigation and there's been no conclusion, it may well impact on uh, the extent to which a regulator will consider you to be fit and proper uh, in the future. Um, I think directors' responsibilities um, have been changing, and this is an important thing to remember in the context of um, uh, board reviews. Uh, personal exposure is, is greater than it used to be, um, with rules applying uh, significant obligations applying to individuals directly. 
And these in, in, involve things like um, the duty to inform a regulator. So um, someone in, uh, caught, captured by the senior manager's regime in financial services has an obligation to uh, inform the regulator in some circumstances. And this needs to be thought of carefully um, when you're dealing with something like a board review and whether issues have been um, ha have come to light. Um, the next thing I'd like to touch on is the challenge bet uh, between um, uh, the of, between individual exposure and collective responsibility. Um, the question I suppose you, you could ask yourself as a director is, do my individual responsibilities to the regulator clash with my collective responsibility to my colleagues? Again, something which may arise in the context of a board review. Um, when the senior manager's regime was introduced uh, post-2007-2008 uh, uh, financial um, crisis, there was a lot of debate about this. There was an awful lot of heat, but not a great deal of light. In my experience, that clash has not been something which has turned out to be particularly um, significant. Um, what I do see and what I think is... Um, uh, at least in my experience, and of course these things are always based on one's own experience, but I've seen it increase in recent years, is you see an increasing number of specialist directors being appointed to boards. And that's particularly around things like uh, tech uh, and more recently AI. And I'm struck on occasion by how often these directors think that their obligation is to uh, give their views uh, in relation to their specialist areas, and they go silent when it comes to the general activity of the board. Now, this is something which uh, is uncovered at, you know, as a part of a board review, and it's a very difficult thing uh, for individuals to understand sometimes. And I've seen it in a number of, of areas, and as I say, uh, more, in, uh, more recently, uh, uh, it seems to me to be becoming a, a, a greater issue. Um, the... Next thing I'd like to touch on is records. Uh, records are a real dilemma for businesses, particularly in areas where um, they are heavily regulated. And um, if I again can come back to uh, financial services, the expectation of financial services regulators is to see quite detailed minutes, for example, of board meetings. Um, that can help make board review easier as it happens, but it also presents uh, other challenges. Um, so to go back to the time when I practiced as a lawyer, uh, I was a regulatory lawyer by background and was always happy to see detailed minutes. Uh, that wasn't necessarily the case for my corporate finance colleagues who uh, often used to worry about the, the potential uh, for, for litigation risk. If you are, have got a business with a US footprint, you will find uh, there's even more alarm about detailed records. But that is something which regulators expect to see. And keeping that balance right um, is an important part um, of, of, of managing uh, your regulatory uh, relationship. Uh, it's important to keep um, uh, regulators uh, informed. Uh, there are um, uh, strict regulatory obligations in financial services to uh, so-called principle 11 and fundamental rule 7 which require businesses to uh, inf uh, notify the regulator of anything which it thinks the regulator should know about. Again, this is an issue which sometimes arises in the context um, of um, board reviews because there may well be events or occurrences which for whatever reason have not been notified to the regulator. Uh, this is in my experience, normally uh, not a conspiracy, it is it is a cock up. Um, and one of the issues I think that may be at the bottom of this is that some firms don't have um, detailed arrangements in place for uh, keeping regulators notified. Um, and certainly I, I think it's, it's advisable for firms to think about um, whether they need to have a formal uh, um, a regulatory um, team who are who are, are whose purpose is to uh, maintain the relationship with the regulator and ensure that the regulator has contact with the right individuals within the organisation and is kept informed uh, in the right situations. Um, I think it's important to remember that regulators tend to look at things in the abstract. 
they don't have detailed knowledge of different types of firms. And every business has its own idiosyncrasies. Uh, and you don't really want something coming up in a board review as a surprise to a regulator. It's worth keeping them in, uh, uh, informed, helping them to understand how your business uh, operates. Um, and also to let them know when things are happening. And it may not just be things that are happening within their immediate sphere of interest. It may well be something else that's happening in the market. So quite often, part of your business will be regulated. Part of it may well not be consumer credit, for example. Um, so you need to think about whether something's happening in the general market, which it will be of interest to a regulator. The last thing you want is the regulator finding out about something when it appears in the Financial Times rather than uh, when you haven't told them about it. Uh, what about uh, when things go wrong? Everybody should have a plan in place uh, for what they will do um, if things were to go wrong. This will be uh, simple things like protecting records, particularly if you've got a bad actor uh, operating, you'll want to be able to be sure that your records are can be easily protected, uh, that IT systems can be uh, protected. Um, you need to think carefully about uh, communications, both internally and externally, um, with the regulator um, and also with others. Um, it, you may well need to... Um, establish uh, an investigation of one form or another. Um, so it's, it's important uh, to, to understand uh, what, 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 what we all do uh, when things go wrong and to have a plan in place. And um, I think that um, sees me um, through. Thank you. Sorry, I'm muted. Ian, do you want to go ahead now? And then we'll take questions at the end. I've got a couple of questions already in the box, so please do keep putting them in the Q&A. Um, but I'll hand over now to Ian, who's going to talk about boards and employees. Uh, thank you, Leslie. And, uh, apologies, everyone, for being uh, a late. Uh, I feel like a disgruntled stakeholder of Transport for London today. But anyway, uh, I'll move on on that. Um, in terms of employees, I'd, I'd really like to go back to something that, that was in the first uh, slide. Um, uh, and that's from the, the guidance on uh, board effectiveness. Um, and the se second paragraph we put in that slide says, um, an effective board understands that a company has to engage with its workforce and to build and maintain relationships with suppliers, customers and others in order to be successful over the long term. And I think that emphasis is, is quite important. Um, it, it is very much a focus, uh, in my, my view, a more important focus on on the relationship between the board uh, and its workforce, um, rather than some of the other um, uh, stakeholders that, that are mentioned there. Quite surprising, perhaps you might say, the customers, which again are, are a very important uh, stakeholder as well. Um, so I, th I think there is a real focus um, from the uh, regulators, such as the FRC and others, on uh, employee engagement. And, and of course, that goes back to the importance of culture and boards and culture and making sure that they understand the organisation. And as we all know, boards don't generally go wrong solely on things like um, uh, processes and procedures. The, the real key factor uh, is behaviour, uh, behaviour and dynamics. Um, so uh, I think the first thing perhaps to, to bear in mind in the relationship with em employees is that um, uh, companies, organisations of whatever size are about people. I know we always, you know, say people are our only, um, you know, our most important asset. In, in many ways, they're, they're our only, only asset. So, I think it's a really, really important relationship for for boards uh, to focus on, and one that sometimes I think they don't focus on sufficiently. Um, but go to what we've, we've said on the guidance on board and effectives there. The board has ultimate responsibility for ensuring policy and practice in line with the company's purpose and values. I mean, that, that's important. And support the desired culture. So again, it's very much um, a focus on, on those areas. And, and certainly the values and culture, I think, are critical. So in board reviews, how, how do we really uh, test? And as board members, how do you know that you are really engaging uh, with employees. I mean, the first thing I would say is, um, uh, I think many boards are not, not very good on this. 
Um, and one of the things that I, I really want to uh, understand when, when I take a board effectors review is how visible the board members are, how they're getting to know uh, the, the, the culture. Um, in my previous career, I used to find out a lot about what was going on uh, from uh, standing by the photocopy and, and just listening to some of the issues that are coming up. I, I've always advised non-execs to, to actually uh, do more to get into the business, but a lot of uh, or a lot of companies, boards, uh, when they go to board meetings, attend the meeting, and then uh, you know once it's finished, they, they rush out and don't actually bother to go uh, and look around the organisation and, and go and meet the, the employees. And I think that's really important. I remember doing a review a few years ago um, where there was a real opportunity for the um, uh, directors to go, the, the non-execs to go and, and meet the employees because un, rather unusually the board meeting had finished an hour early um, and would have been great for uh, for, for, the, for those non-execs to go and um, talk to some of the employees, walk the floor, instead of which they all thought, well, I can get an earlier train back to London now. Uh, I thought that was very much a missed opportunity. It's actually something I commented in the report that, you know, they, they uh, you know, lost a, lost a really good opportunity to get to, to, to know um, people. Um, so it's one of the questions I, I ask in board effectives reviews of the, of the non-execs, you know, how, how much engagement do they have? How visible are they to, to board members? I mean, typically the, the chair and perhaps the SID are very visible, uh, chair particularly so, um, and they may be spending a, a, a huge amount of time in the business, but it is much less so for non-execs. Uh, and that's something I think they're, they're open about. Yeah, we should spend more time. Uh, in the business, if it's a uh, a retailer or a bank, we should be in the branches of the stores more, distribution centres. Um, it, it's sometimes difficult, of course, depending on, on how um, multinational your organisation is. But it's, it's one thing that I think is really important for non-execs to demonstrate that they know the culture uh, of the business by getting to know uh, employees. Um, so... You know, I have in terms of testing that. Um, I think it's also very um, important to, to talk to some employees. So, in a typical board review, I, I won't just talk to the non-execs and the execs and the senior management, on, such as Exco. I will actually uh, talk to some of the employees um, about how visible they think the board members are, um, particularly the non-executive directors. Um, you know, do they know what the board's there for? Uh, you, you know, uh, would they be able to? Would they? feel easy about approaching non-execs, for example. And I think I've never had a uh, an employee say to me, actually, we'd like to see less of the non-execs. They always want to see more. Um, I, I remember one review I undertook, you know, the, the, um, one of the employees I, I talked to said, you know, they don't need to be scared of us. You know, we, we, we are, we're just like them. And we would like to see, see more of the uh, other non-execs and get to know them. Boards often say, well, we, we do do breakfasts and we have lunches and where we invite some of the employees in. And I think that's that's very good and it's very positive. Um, but actually, you're bringing the employees on, onto your territory. Um, and it's quite nerve wracking, I think, for um, you know uh, an employee, particularly if they're fairly junior, to come into the boardroom, even in an informal setting such as a, um, a, a lunch or a breakfast to go and talk to the non-executive director. So... I really think it's very important to to actually go around and, and, and visit employees in 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 their their areas and and, and what that what they're doing. Obviously, it's slightly more difficult now that we we often work, find people are working virtually. But the more you can do that, I think the more better. Um, and there's some other real benefits for doing so. Um, uh, in terms of um, succession planning, again, a, a big criticism of, of boards is that they really only know. The, the, the exco and perhaps the layer below uh and for companies that really want to try and recruit from within it, it's quite difficult to do that if they don't really know the people coming up you know who, who are the who are going to be the the leaders of the business in the future um you know what do we know about them not just you know what their skill base is like and how competent they are but you know how do they behave you know how how would they fit in leading a leading a business how do they engage with the board so I think again, it, it's the real benefit to to do that. Um, I, I I think also um, if uh, you know, it, it's one thing I think you as board members need to think very carefully about is um, 
you know, getting that exposure to, to, to employees it helps them present when they have to come to the board and to get to, get to know the board members uh, better. Um, again, one of the questions I often ask in a, a board effective review is, how do you think it feels as a 23, 23-year-old graduate to come into the board to present on the basis that everybody, if they're sensible, is going to be nervous? But, but what sort of reception do you think that somebody's going to uh, get? Um, again, nearly all board members, nearly all non-execs will say, oh, we're, we're very friendly, we're very open. Um, you know, people come in here and they'll, they'll get a warm welcome. Uh, again, I've tested that and it's not always the case. I did one review where um, uh, somebody came in to present to the board. I was in, in the board doing the observation um, and they found it uh, a board that was very, very cliquey, uh, not particularly engaging, not particularly friendly. Um, and I, I talked to the employee afterwards about, you know, about how they found that experience. And again, feeding that back to the board, there was a, a huge uh, amount of surprise. Again, I think one of the, the, the problems we, we are all often have is, is a lack of self-awareness. And I certainly think that was a surprise to what it was a surprise to these um, uh, these non-executive directors. So, uh, again, something to, to, to really bear in mind in your role as, as non-executives. So I, I know we're, we're running out of time. So I, I just say in many ways, for me, the, the employees is the most important stakeholder, uh, perhaps a lot, perhaps along with the customer. And I think there really needs to be a, a, a more of a, a focus and engagement by non-executives um, towards employees. That's me, Leslie. Thank you very much, um, Ian. That's great. And um, we have got a few questions. Thanks all of you, actually. I don't know. I particularly called on Ian, that you were all great. <laughs> Just to, to start with, I am going to come back to your question, Maswar, um, but uh, Damien Lamons commented while you were talking about the importance of getting to know your employees, which I thought was quite an interesting um, point he made. He says he worked in a large multinational where at the HQ, the NEDs had a key for the elevator that would take them from the car park directly to the top floor boardroom without being interrupted by the lift stopping at any of the floors. And if they took the lift from the ground floor lobby, they would shoot employees out to elevate to the elevator. It's quite nice, isn't it? <laughs> um, and so Sophie also commented about great points around the importance of employees interaction and awareness of a focused approach with the board. I'm going to go back now and apologies if I've said your name wrong. Mahaswar asked a question that he specifically wanted to ask of Alex. Um, so he says, so what could be the solution to minimise the parallel governance you talked about in the different layers, Alex? I think it, I think it is about definition of, of role. Um, uh, and for those things to be actually formally agreed um, by the board, there's no point. The, the risk is that the parallel governance grows by itself um, because government wants to create that parallel. You know, they want their own meetings. They want, want you know, with, with the executives. Um, so um, some practical things. Um, reporting back from from any parallel quarterly performance meetings, reporting back via the um, chief executive, who's probably the accounting officer, who's probably there, um, uh, to make sure that that there is good regular communication um, with the. Um, between the chair and the chief executive and the sponsored department. So sometimes that happens, but it can happen arbitrarily. So again, definition, roles, good reporting, classic stuff. Thank you very much. And Zoe um, said that you raised a fantastic point, Peter, on minutes. And she says she thinks you're absolutely correct. You need the background of the board's decisions set out in the minutes. And a question from Chrisula to all of you, actually. So what recommendations would you have if you do not feel as a non-executive director that the board minutes reflect accurate are not quite reflecting the meeting discussions? So I don't know, Peter, you're at the top of my screen, but you don't have to be on to answer it first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can I can do that. I mean, uh, I think there's a simple answer to that, which is they, they simply have to be accurate. Um, and you have to challenge it. I'm, af I'm afraid that's the only way I think you can deal with that. Um, letting it go, uh, you know, might be easier in the short term, but if um, issues do arise in future, that becomes the formal record. I think um, 
whatever the reason as to why they aren't reflecting what happened, it needs to needs to be challenged. Anyone else got anything they want to add? I agree. I agree with them uh, with uh, uh, what Peter said. Um, uh, I think also, you know, that's a, a symptom. That's not a cause. Um, mm. So, um, uh, so if if minutes aren't being aren't recording um, accurately, what's being said, I want to know why. Mm. Okay, and any NED should want to know why. Leslie, I think that this is a really important point in the current debate around the use of AI and what actually a minute's all about. Um, I think there are a lot of directors who think uh, that minutes are simply a matter of writing down what was discussed, and that's why there's a lot of people who seem to think that AI is the solution to um, simplifying a minute-taking process. Um, if minutes are not correct and not accurately recording mm -hmm. uh, the business of the meeting, certainly for a company director, that actually is prejudicial to their ability to justify how they are fulfilling their duties as directors. Um, but perhaps a slightly more positive way of looking at it is actually not showing the world actually how well they are doing their job in terms of the decision making. And if there is a problem with the minutes, it may well be that actually you've got an inexperienced minute taker that could do with some training and, and um, development help um, or, or, you know, someone who just doesn't understand what minutes are actually there to do. And again, some training or development would probably be quite helpful. Thank you. Moving on, because I'm conscious we've only got just under five, just over five minutes left, and I want to try and get through all of these questions. Um, Tom Bonham Carter's asked for the panel's views on what is the definition of an effective board. It's quite a big question. <laughs> Ian, do you want to start with that one? Um, well, I'll, I'll I'll just take one um aspect of it because we, we obviously haven't got a lot, a lot of time I, I think what i would say is that we focus a lot on having the right skills around the boardroom table um which is all well and good and of course you need them and if you're in financial services you obviously need a chair who's got a, a background in in that um uh but i think there are two things i would say, say on about that firstly um, remember that you you can get your skills from uh, other than uh, just having non-executive directors. So you can get them, for example, um, from expert speakers. You can get consultants in. You can even have an advisory board. So I think that's the, the first thing I say. But I think much more important, and it perhaps goes back to some of the things I, I was saying before, is that behaviours are absolutely key. Um, and one of the things I, I teach on a course, when I, I say to people on the course, you know, um, you can have all the skills you want around the boardroom table to cover everything that your organisation is doing. But if you've got eight or 10 people who can't stand working with each other, you've got an ineffective and a very dysfunctional board. So I, I think for me, an effective board it is one where we've got behaviours that 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 make that board effective. So that doesn't mean that we all get on really well. We can have quite a, you know, we, we, you know, we, we want a board where people are prepared to constructively challenge. We don't want uh, a board where everybody agrees and it just becomes a, a rubber stamp. So I think that that's key, but we, you know, we want people to challenge, but, but pe people do get on, obviously we don't want to uh, fall out, but there's a healthy tension. And I, the, the, the second thing is, I, I would say on that is that the role of the chair is so important in that again obvious statement but I often think the chair is the most underrated position it's so difficult to do well and without a really effective chair then I think it's very difficult to have an effective board so I could I could say a lot more but I think that I'll, I'll leave it there. What about Chris Alex please do you want to add anything to that? Um, I just confirm Ian's view on behaviours I think that's key to it and I'm um, you know, I, I've learned in practice, you can have fantastic corporate governance structures, you can have very good people on the board, but um, if the behaviours are wrong, it, it, uh, it doesn't work. Yeah, you got to, there's got to be an underpinning level of um, trust and mutual respect demonstrated kind of across all, all the board membership and with the stakeholders too. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, so if you've got that, you've got a firm foundation for everything to work. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Leslie, I think there's three C's to me. I mean, you can talk forever on this, but um, I think an effective board communicates well. A board, effective board considers well and, and considers widely and an effective board challenges well. If you get those three right, you're not going to be too far wrong. And I think the behavioural aspect is absolutely critical to that. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, Tracy Ashworth Davis has said, people talk about crossing the line between exec and non-execs. How do you judge that line and whether it's been crossed in board effectiveness reviews? And conversely, how do you mitigate the risk of non-execs not getting involved enough in the, in areas they consider of particular risk? Now, can I take that? Uh, yeah, no. um, so I think I think the, the the thing to remember is the mandate isn't always fixed. Um, so we talk about boards being strategic, although they are there to challenge um, and test the strategy rather than than bring it forward themselves. Uh, and then we talk about you know the the executive being operational. But, but that mandate will move. I mean, it moved, as, as many of you will remember, during COVID, where boards had to become much more operational. If you've got a crisis on, the board is likely to be much more operational. So I, th I think it's important to uh, re remember that. I think in, in board effectiveness reviews, you know, when, when you're assessing that mandate, it's something you, you ask, you particularly ask it of the, man, of, the, of the management, the executive management, how much they feel... Uh, that the non-executives are encroaching. Um, and, it, and it obviously does happen um, uh, from time to time. Um, but, it, but it's something you should, you should, you know, um, you know, re really try to, you know, obviously to, 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 to talk to the, the non-execs as well. The only other thing I would say is I think, um, you know, that the, the non-execs role works really well where they're, they're not interfering in the, um, uh, the work of the executive, but, that there is a sort of mentoring, you know, relationship. Uh, I always say, if I was a chief exec, I would want my non-execs, you know, to you know, uh, people who've you know who've, who've done it, been there, you know, face the crisis, face the issue. I don't, I don't want them to do. So it's, I think it's remembering it's not a doing role, but I, you know, it'd be great to have their insight on uh, on that. Has anyone else got a quick comment on that? Because we've only got three minutes to go. Alex, you're waving your finger at me. Just, just very quickly, ju just to say. Um, on that relationship, it is dynamic, it moves around. Um, bad experiences in the past can inform current behaviour. So if, if there has been difficulty in the past and the non-execs have had to get much more involved because something's gone wrong, that's kind of okay, but then the situation moves on and the, the non-execs need to know how to step back from from that over involvement, okay, period, because it is over involvement if it if it perpetuates. Um, so so changing habits is something that that we that we look at in in reviews. What's happened in the past, and are we still showing the same behaviour that we were doing then for legitimate reasons then, but not legitimate reasons now. Thank you very much. So I am going to call this session to a close now. Um, thank you very much to all of you for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to answer all of them, but we will be sending out the slides um, and a link. We are recording the uh, webinar and a link to the recording. It won't be probably till the end of this week. We will try and answer those questions we haven't answered um, in that uh, email um, communication. Also, um, our very, my very good friends, Peter, Chris, Alex and Ian, have promised to write an article for us for Governance Newsletter, um, which will probably be coming out in the sort of maybe the December issue. And they will pick up on all of these points. Thank you so much to everyone who said how useful they found this. That's it's really nice to hear. We It's nice that um, we think these are good events. It's nice to hear that other people do as well. So thank you for that. And, and then I'm just going to say thank you so much to Peter, Chris. Alex and Ian, um, and wish you all a very good rest of your day. Thanks, you everybody. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.